My people in the East, so you gotta wake up. Midwest, dirty South, so you gotta stand up. All my homies in the West, so you gotta wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Come on, wake up. It is Wednesday night Bible study here in the Walk of Dominion. Come on, share this with many people as you can. Praise and worship has begun. Strange way. Wake up, everybody. Listen, no more sleeping in bed. Share this as soon as you can. Get it to as many people as you can. Talking race and religion. Reframing the foundation here in the Walk of Dominion tonight. Don't want you to miss it. Come on, share it with a friend, as many people as you can. Let's go ahead and get it in. World is in their hands. We need everybody to wake up. I'm glad that you're tuned in. Share this with as many people as you can. I am your host, Dr. Ray Johnson, here in the Walk of Dominion. You're enjoying this word in the comfort of your own home. Seems like we're on our way back to phase one here in Virginia. Make sure you tune in with what our governor has mentioned for us. Make sure that you're safe. Wear your mask. Hope your friends, family, and loved ones are all safe together in one place and sound. This is our year still of clarity, insight, and foresight. We say it this year. It's the year of hindsight, insight, foresight in the year of 2020. Our year hasn't changed. Our annual memory verse still the same. Psalms 146 and verse 8. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. Come on. The Lord raises those that are bowed down. I hope you write in it with me. And the Lord loves the righteous. I'm so glad that the God himself has made us righteous. It is the month of July. We're talking about rebuilding the foundation all month long. And just like we've already had a discussion, if you haven't seen it, with my good friend, Garrett, Garrett, Greg Garrett, make sure you go to our website or go to Dominion On Demand, <coughs> excuse me, and make sure that you get that information. It is something that is certainly good that will help us gain an understanding. Are there two Americas, one for those who are of lighter skin and one for those who are of darker skin? I'm so glad that the Bible says that uh, every nation, every tribe, every language, every tongue shall have access to the tree of life, that Jesus came for everybody. Wednesday night, our theme all month long, reclaiming race in America. We're going to be talking about reframing the foundation. Listen, I'm hoping that you are getting this, reframing and reclaiming race in America, reframing the foundation. If there's ever a time where we've got to begin to reframe the foundation, here in America, it certainly right is right about now. And for the next two Wednesdays, I want to talk to us a little bit about that, of how God plans to begin to reframe the foundation in America. If you're not clear, if you're not sure how God's going to begin to do this, I need you to make sure you're tuned in. Share this with a friend even now <clears throat> as we get started into tonight's discussion. I'm glad that the Holy Spirit is here present with us. Memory verse for the month, put it on the screen large for you, Psalms 11 and 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I believe that we can answer that question. There is absolutely nothing that the righteous can do if the foundations are destroyed. Thus, we're going to spend some time talking this month about race and religion, reframing the foundation of America giving us the opportunity to understand what it is that God meant in the establishment of this nation. If you're looking to grow in your faith with the Lord Jesus Christ, we want you to go to our website right now at www.dow.church or either after the night's teaching is over with, want you to click on Dominion's New Life class. There I am virtually, once you put your information in, talking to you about what it means to be a believer, what it means to have a new life in Christ. We'd love to follow up with you want to make sure that you do that. Share that information with a friend. I'm excited to get into our series tonight talking about reclaiming race in America tonight, reclaiming and rebuilding the foundation of race and religion in America. 
with insight, hindsight, and foresight. Come on, let's pray and let's get into this word. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for my brother and my sister that is watching. Thank you, Lord, for those who are even tuning in even now. Give us, God, a greater understanding, a glimpse of what it is that you meant for America and how you're giving us the opportunity now here in 2020 after we just celebrated the 400th biennium of the first African a slave to set foot on American shores and port comfort, awaken us, cause us to become alive, God, to what it is that you want to do in our nation, what you want to do in our each and every household, rebuild the foundation of our families, communities, and even our country. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, let's get into this word tonight. I'm excited. We have never seen times as these in American history. I mean, our nation is wrestling through racial tension, economic strain, and a major health crisis and pandemic all at the same time. It's one thing for us to experience a little bit of it, and we've had segments of these kinds of things happen uh, previously in history, but this is the first time that we can say all of this is happening together all at the same time. What I believe is that heaven is giving us the opportunity to begin to realign ourselves with God's will is uh, as it is in heaven, so that it shall be on earth. Let his kingdom come. Come on, somebody say amen. Somebody say, type in, reframe it. Our country has had an interesting duality as America's original sin of race rears its ugly head again. I mean, when we look at the injustice that has happened and that has taken place among many African Americans and among many different kinds of people, what we can say is that the historic demonic principalities of race and religion are at it again. But I believe that this time God's giving the church the opportunity to right some wrongs in terms of how we lead inside of our economy and culture. And we are no stranger to this here at Hampton Roads. I mean, the history of race began here in Eastern Virginia. And I believe that we are the Eastern Gate, if you will, and that God wants to, from right out of here in Eastern Virginia, I say it this way, as Hampton Roads goes, so goes the nation with the opportunity to begin to lead the way on how we reconcile from a place of repentance so that we can restructure and align our country along with God's plans and purposes of what he wants to do. The American founding hails from 1607 with indentured servants, but now full-blown slavery with the first Africans to land as slaves in Port Comfort in 1619 today, known as Fort Monroe in the city of Hampton. I would dare say it this way, that I think that those of us who are Hampton born and Hampton bred, we ought to make sure that our nation is Hampton led. Come on, if you're tracking with me tonight, come on, somebody type in, reframe it. When we look at the Declaration of Independence, it says these words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, come on, hear it, with certain unalienable rights, with the certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You've got to understand and know that the rights that are unalienable give to us rights that are alienable. What it means to be unalienable are those rights that are given to us by God because we're created in his image and in his likeness, our humanity, in the sense that we are likened unto God as intelligent and thinking and speaking beings created in his image, created in his likeness. That is what gives us, if you will, opportunity to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All of our alienable rights, rights that are given on behalf of the state, are given to us based upon our humanness and our ability to be able to be created in the image of God. Come on. When you consider this, it was originally written uh, as the pursuit of property. They changed it to the pursuit of happiness because African Americans, if I can give it to you largely on the screen, were viewed as two thirds as humans. Come on, look at it. It wouldn't be until the 13th, 14th Amendment between 1864 and 1868 that would establish slavery, that would uh, end slavery and establish citizenship rights for African Americans. But it would not be until all the way of 1964 with Title VI a Voting Rights Act that would establish the right to vote. Full citizenship rights were not given to us as African Americans all the way until it would seem 1964. And some would say we still don't have full access. When you look at the injustice 
uh, that is happening in terms of health, the injustice that is in terms of our criminal justice system, the disparities in regards to education and economic equity, and as, as well as economic opportunity, it would seem that we are still light years behind. I know that the statement has been made by many that because of the election of Barack Obama to be the 44th president of the United States of America, you know, you put four and four together, that's eight, that's a new beginning. But there are those who simply believe and feel the same way that I do when you consider 400 years minus eight years, huge difference. 411 and eight. Come on, somebody. But not that we haven't made any progress, but we still got a long ways to go. Somebody type in the chat tonight who's watching me. Type in the word. It's about time we got to reframe it. Somebody put the words in. Let's reframe it. Come on, let's get into this. And so what I thought I would do is just take us on a trip, if you will, right on down memory lane because simply because we've got a long way to go doesn't mean that we throw aside America's rich religious history in terms of its Christian influence when we consider the sixth president. President of the United States, John Quincy Adams, he penned these words, the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Did you see that? Christianity. I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles, here it is, of Christianity are as eternal, here it is, and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. The sixth president of the United States of America has said to us that he believes that the general principles are immutable themselves. Come on, can we keep riding through this? Look at this one right here. Had to put in distant relative or cousin of his, Samuel Adams. Look at what Samuel Adams had to say. He said these words. He said, I conceive we cannot better express ourselves than by humbly supplicating the supreme ruler of the world. Who do you believe he's talking about? He's talking about Yahweh, Elohim, El Shaddai. He's talking about the one known as Yahshua HaMashiach. We refer to him today in our time culturally as Jesus, who is the Christ. Here's what he had to say, that the confusions that are and have been among the nations may be overruled by promoting and speedily bringing in the holy and happy period when the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may be everywhere established and the people willingly bow to the scepter of him who is the Prince of Peace. I believe that Samuel Adams was really quoting the opportunity from the book of Revelation that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign. Come on, somebody type it in for me. Forever, with all of our problems, with all of our difficulties, with even our duality of schizophrenia, America still is the greatest nation in the world. My country, it is of thee, sweet land of liberty of the I sing. Even with my dark skin, it is my fathers who died, even along with the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside. Come on, somebody type it in with me. Let freedom ring. It's time to reframe it. There are principalities and powers that are trying to rear their ugly heads again to tear this nation apart. But I believe that God is raising up watchmen on the wall right here from eastern Virginia to begin to stand proxy and to begin to to provide intercession that would pull together the chasms of race and pull together the chasms of religion so that we can truly indeed be one nation under God, indivisible. Come on, somebody shout it with me. With liberty and justice for all. Now, we got some work to do, but it's important that we don't forget the roots from which we hail here in this nation. Come on. Here we go. Let's consider this one. America's rich heritage of history with Josiah Bartlett. He is a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a judge and governor of New Hampshire. Here's what he had to say. To confess before God that aggravated transgressions and to implore his pardon and forgiveness through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. Here it is, that the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, here it is, may be known to all nations, pure and undefiled religion, 
universally prevail and the earth be filled, here it is, with the glory of the Lord. You can't tell me that there isn't a strong Christian influence of the Bible that we believe to be immutable, the Bible that we believe to be inerrant, and the God that we believe to be the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the person of Jesus Christ didn't have a heavy influence upon the framers of the founding of America. It simply had to have been these statements of, of immutability, of inalienable, inalienable rights um, uh, created in the, of the image and likeness of God through our creator. Those are influences that come from the Mishnah and Torah through the Babylonian tabooed. It's established through the Council of Carthage and Nicaea first, then Carthage about the deity of Jesus having influence upon the Magna Carta and then finding its way to the framers here in the United States of America. I hope somebody is hearing me tonight. It's about time that we begin to grab those demonic principalities by the nap of the neck and bring them under the subjection under the lordship of Jesus Christ so that our nation can live out the history of its creed in terms of its design. Now, I got one more for us here that is controversial here in Virginia. Let's hear what Thomas Jefferson had to say in regards to the framing of America. Let's check it out. Here he says these words, the practice of morality being necessary for the well-being of society. He, God, has taken care to impress its precepts so indelibly on our hearts that they shall not be effaced by, listen to Jefferson, the subtleties of our brain. We all agree in the obligation of the moral principles of Jesus and nowhere will they be found delivered in greater purity than in his discourses, the scriptures. Jefferson says, I am a Christian in the only sense in which he wished to anyone sincerely attached to his doctrines. Look at Jefferson in preference to all others. My God in here. Now you cannot say that that kind of language is not germane and specific to the scriptures, the Holy Bible, Holy Writ, as we would know it today. But now, even with that, there is a question. The question is, how is it that men with such a commitment to Christianity and Christian ideals as the framers were, how is it that they could participate in slavery? How could the framers... How could those men who really believe in the adherence to the Judeo-Christian principles, how could they participate in the promulgation of slavery? I believe that tonight we're getting an opportunity to grab the principalities of religion and race by the nap of the neck and put them under our feet from right here in Eastern Virginia and tell the truth about the substance of history so that the United will no longer be divided. I hope somebody is hearing me tonight. Come on, let's go. The answer is through deism and phrenology, how race and religion was able to be continued so that there would be economic prosperity for those of lighter skin on behalf of those with darker skin, it's from these two quadrants of philosophical and theological thought, deism and phrenology. Those are the two convicts, if you will, that should be arrested, the two criminals that should be brought to justice in the courts of heaven to be made manifested here on earth so that there can be peace and tranquility tranquility and goodwill toward all men. Come on, let's explore, explore and expand. Deists believe in a creator or supreme ruler of which Jefferson hails from being influenced by the enlightenment of the universe, but they don't believe that this being, the creator God, involves himself. Here it is, in the day-to-day -day affairs of men. There is no adherence to an accountability 
of a higher power or a higher order, if you will. And as a result, the propagation of slavery ran rampant. Jefferson and many of the framers who owned slaves, they separated out God and his wisdom, God and morality, God and his immutability, God and his deity, God. Anybody hearing me tonight in who the person of Jesus was, they separated him out from the day-to-day -day affairs of the governance of men. And it would be the thought of deism that then would give and make way for theological phrenologists who would then begin to justify the promotion of slavery for economic gain and for economic reasons. I can hear Lawrence Fishburne from the movie uh, Boys in the Hood, where he would pull them around him. Come on, you with me? You at the scene in South Central with me? He's talking to them about gentrification. And he's beginning to explain to them that when you follow the dollar, when you follow the money, the money won't lie to you. Dead presidents in the movie, when they're sitting around at the table, they're getting ready to talk about the bank job and they talk about the dead presidents, they say the money don't know where it came from. Well, yes, it does. I believe it's got a conscience. And if the Bible is correct, I feel preaching coming on me. I'm trying to teach through here so that we get understanding. But if the Bible is right and we consider the words of God concerning what Cain did to Abel, he said, the blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. Where are you, Cain? I believe that the blood of black boys, the blood of black girls, the blood of black women, the blood of black uh, men, the blood of native of women, the blood of native men, the blood of native children are crying out from the ground, crying out for justice. And we've got to ensure that we right some wrongs by taking the next steps forward, by understanding how we got here. And that's why we're talking about this tonight. And so phrenologists like man right here, Thomas Duke, 1802 to 1846, was a professor and then president of the College of William and Mary. He was also a member of the House of Burgess, the Virginia House of Burgess, that today we know as the Virginia House of Delegates. He was an influential pro-slavery advocate, and he began to advocate for the continuation of phrase slavery from the understanding of phrenology. The, the brains, come on, let me go back there again. You've seen the movie, Django. Come on, Mr. Candy. You with me now at the table talking about old Ben and the two dimples in the back of his neck causing him to be more prone to servitude and civility through bondage. Thomas Dew was one of those as a theologian, as a public policy maker, and as an administrator who would then influence the lawmakers of the time throughout the South to continue the propagation of slavery. That's how we got here. Follow the money. It was the phrenologists, the policy makers, and the theologians that wanted to protect their way of life to ensure that there would be money made in the South kept away from those in the North. I don't got time to go into all of that. But tonight, I want to kind of cross the field a little bit what texts were used? This is Bible study. Somebody type it in. Ain't but one way to study the Bible, and that's to do what? Study the Bible. What text did the, did the theological phrenologists use to justify slavery? What text did the, AF, did the Methodist preachers and the Congregationalists use at the time? The Anabaptists. What text of scripture did they use to justify slavery and to justify the way of living and to justify the thought process that had so much of America confounded and appearing to be in a place of a duality? Here is one of those texts right here. It comes to us from Genesis chapter nine, verses 18 through 24. Let's pull the principalities now down and put them under our feet. Come on, let's go. Ride with me as I read through these texts of scripture and then we'll take some time to explain it. Let's go. Here we go. The sons of Noah. Now this is after the fall. God is repopulating the earth 
through a righteous man named Noah who has three sons. And these three sons are believed to be the father of all the different people groups that span throughout the ages of time. And if you believe this literally in terms of its application, we're going to find ourselves with an understanding of how slavery became justifiable. Let's watch it. Now, the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. Note that. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer. He planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk. Somebody say for the stomach's sake. And became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. What did Ham do? Let's read it again. Ham, the son of Noah, the father of Canaan, Noah's grandson, saw the nakedness of his father. And what did Ham do? Told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders. Notice it says both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Oh, it's going to get gooder and gooder in just a few seconds. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. Well, why does it say both of their shoulders if they don't see their father's nakedness? We're going to get there in a second. So Noah awoke from his wine, somebody say from the stomach, say, and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, now he says the younger son had done to him. Then he said, cursed be Canaan. But Noah got three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. But why is he saying cursed be Canaan? A servant of servants shall be, he be to his brethren. King James says, shall he be to his brethren. A slave of slaves is what the King James Version says. Shall he be to his servants. And this is what the text, this is the text that was used to justify slavery in America. Now, there are a couple of observations. Come on, theologians and exegetes in the text, ride with me. Questions are, who is Ham and Canaan? Ham is Noah's son, believed to be the father of all melanated, dark-skinned people of the world. That would be the Africans and the Hispanics, he would be the father of those with dark and melanated skin. Canaan is his grandson from out of which many of those who settled in Arabia and Northern Africa, that would be Canaan. And there also are some Africans that come from Canaan also. But now, and you can find this in Genesis 10, because it gives you the people groups of population throughout the earth. But now what is interesting in the development of this is the association of Ham and Canaan is on purpose by the King James writer in the text. The text has a psychological misapplication through associating Ham and Canaan together when you read the sequence of it which makes it very easy to suggest that Ham and Canaan are the same person. If you Google this, you'll see uh, when you look at what does this term to uncover the father's nakedness mean? That's a key. And when you Google it, some will say that Ham is, uh, that Canaan is Ham's uh, youngest, that is Noah's youngest son. But he is not. Canaan is Ham's son. He is Ham, Noah's grandson. I'll do it again. Some are suggesting that Canaan is Noah's youngest son. He is not. He is Ham's son, which makes Canaan Noah's grandson. All the text says is that Ham saw something, that he didn't do anything. And the key is, what did he see? Ham saw the nakedness of his father. 
The question becomes, theologically, what does the term nakedness of his father mean? What does it uncover? Let's ride. Uncovering the nakedness of your father is a Hebrew idiom meaning to have a sexual union or relationship with the mother. Ham did not see his father's nakedness. Instead, he saw Canaan with his grandmother, Noah's wife, Ham's mother, having sex with his grandmother. He saw something. And through him seeing it, he saw the nakedness of his father being uncovered by his son. This is what Ham saw. But his two brothers, Sham and Japheth, wouldn't look at Canaan, their nephew, having sex with his their mother. They would not look at it. So what they did was they covered it. Now watch what the King James writer does. He says he puts the curse that Noah gives to Canaan as a result of watching this to be one to suggest that those with dark skin are all cursed. My God in here. And when you deal with the extrapolation over time, what you're finding is Simon the Serene, a Canaanite, a brother, being a servant to the Jew Jesus, carrying the cross for him to die for all of the sins of humanity. My God in heaven. The white slave masters were influenced by the phrenologists and the theologians of the time, the preachers, who misconstrued the text to justify slavery. My God in here. So here we go to uncover the nakedness by the text. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Leviticus 18 and 7. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Now, come on, let's get it in the break it down version. Same verse in the New Living Translation. Do not violate your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. You must not have sexual relations with her. And these are things that would be practiced among the Canaanites and why God would give Israel, the Hebrews, the Mishnah and the Torah from the mountain of Sinai because of these kinds of practices. But the slave masters were influenced by the phrenologists and the theologians of the time to justify slavery by misconstruing a text to ensure that all people with dark skin would now have to be slaves for the purposes of economic gain. But I think it's high time that we reframe and that we rebuild the foundation of this nation so that America can be who it's supposed to be. It's critically important that we reclaim and reframe the foundation. Its intent was for it to be a light to the world of the gospel of Christ. However, when we don't accurately portray history and the scripture, we error. The foundation of something is critically important. The Bible says, Psalms 11 and 3, if the foundations are destroyed, what? Can the righteous do when you're building a house? If the foundation isn't laid properly, when it is built to the roof line, when the computation isn't right in the in the footer system, the roof line, what's off in the footer system by an inch will be off by a mile in the roof line. And sure enough, if America is not off by a mile right now from its original sin, and we got to pull it back in and get it back in line so that the gospel can be preached, so that there will be unity among us in our nation where there is truly liberty and justice for all. I hope this is helping somebody. And the only way that can happen, as our framer said, is an adherence to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight, if you don't know him, I want to pray with you tonight. If you have felt that Christianity 
has not been meant for you. I'm going to do another teaching next week. But I want to say to you tonight that as those of us with dark skin, we're all through the book way before the Council of Nicaea considers the deity of Jesus. One of the greatest theologians who will be responsible for modern day Christian thought, St. Augustine, brother of Egypt Coptic script. But that's not so important. What's important is that you must receive the Christ that he has taught about, that he has written about in your heart to be separated from your sin so that you've got relationship with God the Father through the person of Jesus Christ, another dark-skinned man. I got to pray with you tonight if you've never received Jesus, if you thought that Christianity was the white man's religion, if you've had the thoughts that the, the Bible was not written for you, that relationship with God through Christ is not yours, I want to say to you tonight, I want to bind the yoke and the bondage of evil and wickedness through the lies of the enemy that will keep you separated from God through Christ. I'm going to pray with you tonight, and I want you to receive Jesus in your heart of hearts. And I want you to come back to the Lord and to come back to the roots of your faith found in Christ Jesus. Come on, would you pray with me tonight? Father, in Jesus' name, I'm grabbing your hand tonight to pray with you into the screen. Say these words with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need a savior. Come into my heart. Save me. Change me. Cause me to be your child. I repent from my sin. I recognize I need a savior. Would you transform me? Would you change me? And I'll live with you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on. Somebody said amen. I'm excited if you made that prayer tonight. Listen, I want you to do one other thing for me before you go. I want you to text the word believer to 4069 and 1. I need you to text the word believer. Click on the link in the message. And what's going to come back to you is going to be me opening up in the screen, talking to you about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Welcome to the family of God, my friend. I'm glad you prayed tonight. Come on, you know what time it is now. It's giving in the sanctuary, giving in the chapel, giving in your dinner. If this word blessed you tonight, we're going to be giving away food again this coming Sunday. I need you to go to dow.church, click on giving, go, and then text 40691. Come on, wake up, everybody. And then text the word Dom Give to 40691. Or you can go to our Cash App. If this helped you tonight, share this with a friend. Walk up D O M M I N and share it with somebody. Let's give tonight. Thank y'all for tuning in. I hope this was a blessing to you. Let's pull the principalities of race and religion down under our feet. Let's become one America. Let's be one nation. All month long, I'll be talking to us simply about rebuilding the foundation, reframing and reclaiming race in America. I hope this was a blessing to you. Share this with a friend. We'll see you again next week. God bless you, my friend. Bye-bye. Time for a change.